Hello, I'm Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies. And joining us on today's Immigration Newsmaker discussion is Tom Homan. You know him as former Acting Director of ICE, but he also turns out to be a writer. He's got a new book out, um, Defend the Border and Save Lives. We're going to be talking about the book uh, today and uh, talking about immigration in general as well. Tom, thanks for joining us uh, for taking time out of your uh, out of your day looks like uh, you're looks like you're not growing a quarantine beard like I am but um, well, I was but I shaved it uh, oh, there you go in a fox show yesterday I didn't think it was they'd like it so I shaved it yesterday okay thank you so so anyway uh, to get into the book the, the the first thing I really noticed in reading it is how personal it is in other words it's not just a Washington policy book about we should do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, that's in there. But also, you really start with sort of your own story. You were in the Border Patrol growing up in upstate New York, all that stuff. So, um, you know, why'd you want to make it such a personal book, uh, at least in part? Well, look, because I, I know a big part of this country doesn't like who I am. They don't like what I stand for. They don't like my position on immigration. And of course, I've been called, even by members of Congress, I've been called a bigot. Uh, in a, you know, there's, there's outlets out there calling me a racist and a, a xenophobic, and you name it. And I just want to set the record straight on who I am. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kid that grew up in a small town up on the Canadian border in upstate New York, and I've had a, I had a great childhood. And the reason it was important for me to talk about my childhood and how I grew up is to explain to American people that is what our President Trump wants to get back to. He wants to get back to the America that you and I grow, grew up in, Mark. I mean, the America I see right now is so divided and there's so much hate out there. It's, it's, and, and, and especially right now in the, middle, uh, in the middle of this pandemic, where I grew up and how I grew up in the America I grew up in, every single person in this country would be circling their wagons around our commander in chief to attack this as a nation, this pandemic, take it on as a nation. And I just don't see that. So it's important when I wrote this book to let everybody understand who I was, how I grew up in the America I grew up in. And then I take the argument from there, trying to get back to that America where everybody hung an American flag in the front porch. People actually supported the president, whether he, whether you voted for him or not, he's the president of this nation. So I, I thought it was important to talk about how, how I became to be. So um, there's obviously you talk about all the different pieces of immigration uh, in your book, you know, E-Verify, border control, all of that stuff. One thing that I thought I wanted you to talk about a little bit, and you couldn't have talked about it in the book because you wrote this before the virus thing happened, but what are your thoughts about ICE detention and ICE being pressured to let everybody go because of you know fears that supposedly the virus is going to hit them in detention? Sort of that whole issue, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, th I think... I think the left, I think uh, uh, groups like ACLU and the left is using this pandemic, you know, uh, they're using this crisis as a way to get their agenda in place. Uh, look, they're open borders. They don't believe in immigration detention. And uh, they're using this pandemic as a way to get to their agenda. And uh, look, it, people need to understand every time ICE puts somebody in detention, they already go through a series of reviews, including health. If, if, if there's an illegal alien that they want to put in detention, but there is a health issue that we can't pop properly uh, take care of, then we won't detain them. If we can't take care of that person, we won't detain them because we are responsible for the health and safety of everybody. So it, when this pandemic happened, no need to sue ICE to release uh, aliens because ICE already did a deep dive on everybody they had in detention. They looked at anybody at age 60 or over, even though the CDC and World Health Organization put the number at 65, ICE went to 60. Anybody above 60 with prior medical conditions that make them more susceptible to this disease or, or this virus, and if they weren't a public safety threat, they released them. ICE released, you know, last count I knew it was like 800 people out of, out of the 32,000. So they've already done this as a matter of practice. And and plus, you got our immigration health services. I, uh, I I see within ICE, there are doctors and nurses that you know have our medical program. They're used to dealing with infectious diseases. We deal all the time. Uh, disease comes across that border all the time. I've had facilities shut down because of chickenpox or measles. We've had lice. We've had uh, <laughs> TB. 
And one thing that's important, a couple of years ago when I was ice director, we had a case mark of someone that was arrested by the Border Patrol, a male that had a TB, had a strain of TB that was unrecognizable. And none of the current drugs could treat it. It wasn't effective. So we worked with the Department of Public Safety. We worked with the CDC trying to figure out what kind of cocktail can we give this person to, to address this strain of TB he had. After a couple months, we figured it out. But he stayed in detention for like six months while we treated him. Think for a moment if he wouldn't have been arrested by the Border Patrol and would have got into our, in, our, in our cities and our towns. So we dealt with diseases all the time. So to use this pandemic as an excuse just to release everybody's ridiculous. ICE has already vetted it. And of course, we got we got judges, liberal judges across the country who have demanded release of certain detainees to include specific, specific public safety threats. I can name right now, there's been at least three releases of illegal aliens that were convicted of homicide. There's been released of at least three other aliens around this country that were convicted of rape. There's at least one alien that was released by a judge's order in molestation of a child, sexual assault of a child. So it's ridiculous, and that's why you know we need to keep fighting. Even during a pandemic, it doesn't mean the rule of law goes out the window and, and, the, and the rule of consequence and deterrence goes out the window. We still got to enforce our laws. We still got to protect this country. We still got to secure our borders. Something else on detention. You talked about this briefly in the book, but didn't really go into it a lot, and that is this issue of so-called private prisons. In other words, using contractors for detention. And I've been to some ICE owned detention facilities and almost everybody there working there was a contractor anyway. So I'm not sure what the difference is if the contractor owns the building or not, but there, this has been a thing that the anti-enforcement people have really been pushing. And I was wondering, you know, what are your thoughts? Does, does um, using contractors for detention, in other words, contract facilities, so-called private prisons, does that work? Are there abuses there that wouldn't happen if it was all owned by ICE. What are your thoughts on that whole issue? Well, the reason the reason we go to private detention contractors is because of two reasons. Number one, they're cheaper. The government doesn't do anything. Uh, everything we do costs a lot. The facilities that we own, like the SBCs we own in Buffalo and, and in Georgia, there are. If you want, to ask me the most expensive beds we maintain. The, the, the beds are the ones of facilities that we own because the government. We never do anything very smart or, or very cost effective. We're the government, right? But the private detention contractors, they got state-of-the-art facilities. And, and I make this argument in my book. They got the highest detention standards in the industry. No one can match the detention standards that our private detention contractors have, especially our big corporations like GEO and CoreCivic. Their detention standards are, are the top in the world. And, and, and I say that for a couple of couple reasons. Number one, when I was the ICE director, I can't tell you how many county sheriffs either stop detaining our, our, our aliens by contract or refuse to enter in a contract with us because our detention standards are too high. And they would argue with me, why would I change the com uh, composition of my jail to, to give all these benefits to illegal aliens because your detention standards are so high and your medical review is so high? Why would I change all, all of that at a great cost when I don't even do that for U.S. citizens? So a lot of sheriffs backed out of our contract because our detention standards are too high. So I'll say two things. Number one, the facilities run by Core Civic and Geo, our two biggest contractors, are the best facilities in the world. You can't find another detention facility in the world that operates at the efficiency and the high detention standards they have. The, the, the medical care is state of the art. So I, su I, I support them because they do it better than the government does it. Their detention standards are higher than the government ever had previously. Again, you can argue about, you know, for profit prisons, but they just don't support ICE. They support state and federal. They support U.S. Marshals. They support many counties and large cities across the country. It's 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 a, a smarter way to do business, and it's a higher detention standard. If people actually look at what I would call, if you look on the ICE website, look up PBNDS11, uh, and it shows the detention standards that are, are in most of our facilities, covers over 80% of our detainees, they'd be shocked to see how high these detention standards is and how well we treat people in our custody. Yeah, that really came home to me once. Um, I was visiting a county jail that had a contract with ICE. And so part of the jail was holding detainees. Part of it was the regular county prisoners. And I asked the uh, guy who ran the facility, I said, do you put your new deputies, you know, the sort of the rookies, are they, do they start out in the immigration side and then you move them up to the regular jail? He said, oh, heck no. He said, 
because, like you said, the standards are so high and ICE is so demanding that he actually only is able to basically promote his most reliable and experienced guards to work in the ICE part of his facility because uh, because the standards are so much higher. Anyway, I mean, it really struck home to me. And because and because the medical standards are so high, if you look at the data, data is clear. If you look at the deaths in custody of state and federal prisons across this country, the average is one death um, in 100,000, for every 100,000, the average is in the state and federal facilities, about 200 to 223 deaths per 100,000. In ICE, it's nine. Nine per hundred thousand. Right. That's a fraction of what other what what the state prison system is. The state prison, the, the federal penitentiary, the state prison system. It's a fraction. You got someone like AOC yelling and screaming about healthcare in our facilities. The the, the 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 amount of deaths in our facilities is a fraction, percentage wise, of what the New York City jail system is. Like like we're like we're seventeen percent of what New York deaths in New York City custody if you, if you do it by percentage wise. So if you look at nine per hundred thousand compared to most other facilities, is two hundred per hundred thousand. You can't argue that ICE has a great medical uh, uh, program. The uh, one last question on this detention issue, because it really is one of the things that's most in the news. What do you think of what they the advocates call alternatives to detention, which is to say they're pushing to not lock people up to make sure that they show up for their hearings later, but use ankle bracelets or have somebody call them once a week or whatever it is, various, like they said, alternatives to detention. Do those things work? Uh, what are the drawbacks? My sense is they end up actually being a lot more expensive um, because you end up having to keep people in that kind of operation longer. But what's your experience been with that? Well, you're exactly right. I mean, the alternative to detention, like an ankle bracelet, it's, it's, it's a good alternative if you have another choice, but let, let, let's, let's be perfectly clear. 95% of everybody ICE deports from the United States, we deport from a detention bed. Because we have custody of them. The average length of stay in detention is about 38 days right now, 38 to 40 days. So in 38, 40 days, that person has due process per the legal system, and we can remove them. If, if they get released from detention, put on an ankle bracelet, it's a lot cheaper per day to wear the ankle bracelet and be in detention bed. But on an ankle bracelet, it takes us four or five years to remove them. So if you do the math, it was much cheaper to keep them in detention for 30, 40 days and keep them on an ankle bracelet for four or five years. Also, the ankle bracelets are pretty good at getting people to court. We can track them when they get to court. But when it comes to actually removing that person, the numbers aren't nowhere as near as, uh, as good. So for, for those people that we can't take care of and have medical issues or there's some other humanitarian reason why they can't be detained, ankle braces are a good alternative to make sure they get to court. But beyond that, there's nothing better than detention. Detention's faster, it's cheaper, and it's more effective. And I think the point you made about the difference between actually show, showing up to court and actually showing up to be deported, I think is important because you know, you got nothing to lose to show up to court if when you lose your case, nobody comes looking for you and you're not in detention anyway. So, I mean, that's that's a distinction I think that people yeah. just don't get. Well, with, with with ankle braces, getting them helps, you know, us track and make sure they get to court. That is good for another reason, because if they're actually in court and they get a final order or removal from a judge, that gives them less appeals down the road because if they fail to show up in court, next you know they're arguing, well, I wasn't notified, I never got the notification, didn't show up in court, I was ordered in absentia, then they file an appeal. Get them to court and hearing that appeal, being in person when they get that when they get that final order means that they got le less room for appeals, and, it's, and if we do find them, it's, it's a quick removal. So they can't say the dog ate their uh, deportation notice or something. So, be yeah. surprised how many excuses they get. <laughs> the um, what's amazing, Mark, is it, what's amazing is these people can find their uh, their way from Central America to our border <laughs> and to the city they want to go in, and join their family in. But for some reason, they can't find an immigration court in the very city in which they live. It's it's amazing. The um, you also have a chapter in your book on the wall. Uh, and obviously this is the president's, uh, it was always his signature issue. Um, Ann Coulter, whom I like, Ann's a friend, but she's hammered the president that, you know, there hasn't been any wall construction. 
My sense is, I mean, from actually being down there, there actually is a good deal of activity going on. What are your thoughts on what's going on on the wall and what um, ICE needs, not ICE, but generally what we need from a wall? Because ICE doesn't have anything to do with the wall, but obviously it affects what ICE does. Well, look, I, I'm a big fan of Ann Coulter, too, and I, I appreciate her stances on immigration. But she also has to understand that the president's trying to build this wall with Congress fighting him for every dollar. He's got people, he's got environmental groups suing him over environmental laws. Uh, and you got uh, uh, Indian reservations suing because they're on their land. I mean, there's constant court battles and litigation over building this wall. Plus, Congress doesn't want to fund the wall, even though they funded border barriers for the last two decades, including Schumer and Pelosi and the rest of them. All of a sudden, with President Trump, they, they don't want to build a wall. Now it's a bad idea. But look, if you what, what I talk about in my book, every place they build a border barrier, it has been 100% effective. What, what I mean by that is it has resulted in less illegal immigration and less drug flow. If you take San Diego sector for an example, I, I talk about this in my book. When I was a border patrol agent in San Diego sector, I was up in Campo, up on a mountain. But, you know, it's a GS-5. It's hard to afford to live in San Diego as a GS-5 border patrol agent. So I'd work every day I could a six and seven day overtime down to San Ysidro, down at Brownsville, Chula Vista Station. And we worked what they call the soccer fields. There was a, you know, there was a, a barbed wire fence and had a soccer field just north near Tijuana. And when the sun's going down, you would literally see thousands pile up across the whole terrain. And when the sun went down, it was, it was they come across the border in droves. And it was how many can you catch? How many, you know, how many got away? How many can you catch? Because once they get into San Ysidro, they're lost. So it was it was really eye opening. But once they built a border barrier in San Diego. I talked to Chief at the time, Rodney Scott, when they were looking at the prototypes in San Diego. He said they were in 95% operational control of that border. They went from 2,000 arrests a night to 30, 32 a night in that sector because the, the, the fence worked. Now, the Waller building, of course, it was based on, you know, like eight different prototypes. They had all these prototypes built by these manufacturers. Border Patrol hired, you know, uh, outside teams to try to drill through them and climb them. They had their SRT team, Navy SEALs. They brought them in, try to climb and try to drill through and try to try to penetrate it. And so they took a little bit of each prototype and created their wall, which is a baluster that they can see through. And it's working. And, and you're right. They've already built, I think, just shy of 200 new miles beyond. But what the left keeps talking about is this isn't this is an all new wall. It's replacement wall. Well, the president is building the wall exactly where the border patrol wants them to build it. So if they have a dilapidated fencing that no longer is effective, the border chain, here's where our traffic is. Replace this fencing first before you build brand new fencing way over here. So the 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 the, the, the wall that's going up is built exactly where border patrol wants it built based on apprehension data. So I think every mile of new wall, regardless if it's a replacement wall, is new wall that is more effective than the dilapidated wall that was there. So I think they'll have a good four to five hundred miles built by the uh, end of the year, and I think it's. I think the president's keeping his promise to the American people. What really irritates me is when I hear the Democrats call it Trump's vanity wall. This isn't Trump's wall. This is America's wall. We've proven it works. And so why not do what we can to give the border patrol the tools they need to secure our border? It just it, it makes sense. And I think to reinforce your point, I mean, I've been to a good deal of the border too, and some of the places where they're saying the existing barrier is being replaced, the existing barrier may have been barbed wire. It may have been rusted through landing mat from Vietnam. I mean, literally, it was army surplus from 50 plus 60 years ago. Um, and in some cases, it may be new, but it's the vehicle barriers. They call them Normandy barriers. It's basically like a chain link, I mean, a uh, like a uh, sort of one, a, a, a ranch fence, a corral fence, except it's made out of metal. And, you know, your grandma could hop over it or climb under it. Replacing that with a 30 foot high bollard wall is a new wall, just to reinforce your point. And that's a good point. Back in 19, I talked about this in my book, back in, I think it's 1986, I was part of a, a group of two or three border patrol agents that had the highest, the biggest seizure in the history of border patrol at the time. It's like 220 kilos of cocaine. Ascension went off uh, in uh, in Hakuma, California, and we we responded to the center. It was a drive through A guy was driving a utility truck, like you see a electrician's truck, right over the barbed wire fence. Came in the United States, but we had sensors on that road because they'd done it before. We stopped it. Got over 200 kilos of coke, which at the time was the largest cocaine seizure in history of border patrol. When I was back to the International Chiefs of Police Association a couple years ago in San Diego, 
I took one day off and drove up to my old to my old station and, and where I used to patrol. And I went to that place. We got that truck. Guess what? There's a big, beautiful wall there now. So no truck can drive across that wall, which which adds to one more thing I want to add real quick. Do not believe when the left keeps saying most drugs come through the port of entry. So there's no need, need for a wall. The wall's not going to stop drugs. That is wrong. What people need to understand, more drugs are seized at a port of entry because every vehicle stopped. Then based on the interview, they decide whether they're secondary to that vehicle or not. If you're a drug smuggler, you know you are, you know 100% you're going to be stopped and you're going to be talked to. So a lot of seizures happen at port of entry because they, they have, have more thorough inspection. We don't know what comes between the ports of entry because not every vehicle stopped, not every, not every backpacker stopped or caught by the Border Patrol. So I still say more drugs come between the port of entry. If I'm a drug smuggler, I know my car is going to be stopped going through San Ysidro or I can drive through a drive through where there's no fence built yet. I'm going to pick the drive through My chances are better. So that's I think it's a false narrative for the, for the, a lot of Democratic leadership to say more drugs come through the port of entry. No, it's, more drugs are seized at a port of entry. It's kind of like the old joke about uh, the drunk's looking for his keys under the street light, and uh, he's they, somebody asked him why is he looking there. He said, "Well, the light's better here. I, you know, it may not, it may be I dropped it over there across the street, but the light's better here." So yeah. anyway, um, yeah, there's no question about it. Let me. There's a question somebody. Um, had submitted, and for anybody who uh, is listening, if you want to submit questions, uh, you can email them to mrt at cis.org or on Twitter at cis underscore org. Now, the president recently, I think it was yesterday, uh, was asked about something and what he said about the state bailout bills, in other words, bailing out some of the states or maybe cities too. I, I didn't uh, hear him say it. Um, because of you know because of the pandemic that any bailout money should come with strings that they're they should not be sanctuary cities in other words they should end their sanctuary policies what are you what's your thought on that specifically but then generally sanctuaries and uh, overall i agree i look the sanctuary cities they're 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 un-american and they're a threat to the our way of life they're they're, they're a threat to the u.s citizens in this country uh, if you look at who's what states are asking for bailouts, New York, California, Illinois, all these are sanctuary cities. When, when, when Gavin Newsom spends millions of dollars giving illegal aliens, you know, um, help, and when you when you give them free college tuition and driver's licenses and free medical care, like New York City, they get free medical care. In California, free medical care. When you when you spend that kind of money on illegal alien population, I'm not surprised you, you, your state's going to bankrupt. Second of all. We got to stop rewarding illegal behavior. I've said this many, many times. When you know everybody wants to know, I talk about you know family separation and and and, and cages, and everybody has felt how Trump, you know, this border is out of control. The reason the border is out of control because the Democrat leadership failed to stop offering enticements. While the president got eighty percent control on the southern border by his out of the box thinking, working with Mexico and Central America, building a wall, doing all the things this president has done to remain a Mexico program. At the same time, every Democrat running for president was talking about getting rid of ICE. Let's get rid of ICE. Let's end immigration detention. Let's end private uh, uh, jails making money on this. Let's uh, let's give free medical care to illegal aliens. Let's give them driver's licenses. Let's, let's continue with sanctuary cities where even, they can come to our city, commit a crime, and we still won't work with ICE. When you offer these kinds of incentives, why do you think they're coming? They're coming because we're incentivizing them to come, and we keep rewarding illegal behavior. So I, I stand with the presence. We got us. This country has proven over and over and over again: come to this country legally, ignore a judge's order. You have to leave. Go become a fugitive. Hide out long enough, and you're going to get something. You're going to get DACA, or you're going to get amnesty. We'll give you something. We got to stop rewarding illegal behavior. If we stop that, we can actually, you know, address this crisis once and for all. But I stand with the president. Sanctuary cities. If they're a sanctuary city, they shouldn't get a bailout from the United States government. Absolutely not. Why should I pay for New York City to release some MS-13 gang member to the street and give him free medical care? Now they're in financial trouble. They want me to bail them out. Why should Why should we do that? I I, I, I agree with the president. I'm with him 100% on that. You had a whole chapter on in your book, uh, just as a reminder for people tuning in, Defend the Border and Save Lives. It's, um, let's see if I can get that on the screen. There you are. Uh, available at any virtual bookstore because uh, there's no real bookstores right now, but uh, Amazon, elsewhere, you can get it. You have a chapter on illegal employment, and um, I, I think you maybe remember I asked you early in your uh, 
uh, term as uh, acting director of ICE about enforcement at the work site because that's the magnet that's drawing people in. You can have million mile walls with machine guns and you can have ICE agents everywhere and border patrol. If the magnet pulling people in, if you can still, it's easy to get a job, it's gonna be hard to control that. And um, you had said that under your, while you were there, you had a 400% increase in worksite enforcement. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance of it, but also the challenges of actually getting you know, the ban on hiring illegal aliens enforced. Well, I think, you know, work, as you said, work site enforcement is a huge magnet. If, if, if these people can't get jobs and they get here, um, many of them won't come. Because, look, you look at the uh, immigration, the international organization migration, the part of uh, the United Nations actually did a study in this. When we had this crisis on the board, these families coming across and this unprecedented surge the last couple of years, IOM actually did a study. And they themselves found that 60 to 70 percent of these people who claim they're, they're escaping fear and persecution from the government are coming here for, for economic reasons. They're coming here to get a job. And all you got to do is look at the billions of dollars. Last year, $80 billion was sent to Mexico through remittances of illegal aliens living here, sending money back to Mexico. So coming here to the United States is a big, it's a big magnet. And I did, when I was ICE director, you called me out at one of my first meetings about uh, immigration uh, taking seriously worksite enforcement. And I, I committed to you that day, we'd increase by 400%, which they did. I think they actually got 416%. But it, it, it makes a difference. I, I give me one I give me one example. They shut down a, a sausage packing plant up in Detroit area, and they arrested uh, over 100 illegal aliens. And guess what? We know, we know who took those jobs after those were removed from the workforce? Uh, 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 black Americans. Um, actually replaced the you know, unemployed black Americans in that area actually took those jobs. And look, you, you look at, and, and the reason enforcement of, enforcement of work site is so important, because number one, a lot of ID identity theft goes on. People's credit gets ruined because these people use their, uh, their social security number. And no one hires an illegal alien on the goodness of their heart. They hire them for a couple reasons. Number one, they'll, they'll, they can work them harder, pay them less, and undercut the competition. And I can, let me explain a personal issue I had. I had roof damage on my house after a storm a couple years ago. I had to call five different roofing companies till I found a roofing company that would guarantee me a legal workforce. Then when that company came, it was a father and a son. The father sat there and he talked to me and he recognized me right away. And he says, okay, now I understand why you want a legal workforce. He goes, he goes let me tell you my story. I had over 20 U.S. citizen employees. I had a pretty big company where we placed roofs, roofs all across Virginia. He goes, but I can no longer compete with the companies hiring illegal aliens. They were paying five bucks an hour down the roof, where a U.S. citizen not going to get up on the roof in the middle of summer five bucks an hour. He goes, they're underbidding me on all these jobs. I end up leave, I end up laying off over twenty United States citizen employees because I could no longer afford them because I couldn't compete with illegal alien labor. So it has it is it has hurt the, the, uh, our wages in this country. It has, it has driven wages down. It has displaced U.S. citizen workers. And plus, it's an enticement to come to this country. E-Verify isn't foolproof. It can be beat. I talk about that in my book. But, but it's the best thing we got going right now. And it has prevented thousands upon thousands of illegal ones getting to cry. I talk in my book how we can improve E-Verify. And what's frustrating to me, Mark, there's even some Republicans in Congress who don't want to see E-Verify enacted. If they truly want to stop illegal employment, they need a system, a checks and balance system. E-Verify with some moderate changes could be effective. So I'm with you. I think the I think the president needs to continue to push uh, some sort of system like E-Verify to, to stem the flow of illegal alien labor. And look, just, you. just look what he's done just recently on the, on his immigration proposal on the, the resident aliens. Anybody coming, he's going to stop that to save both jobs for Americans during this pandemic. I've actually I've actually talked about I've talked about on, on Fox News. It needs to be expanded, especially to H one Bs and H two Bs. It needs to be expanded to temporary workers who really make an impact. But because even before this pandemic, H one B had displaced thousands of U.S. citizen workers in a high paying IT field. So we need to go further with it. So illegal immigration, big magnet. We need we need to address it. If we truly, and I say it in my book, if we truly need foreign labor do our work, then create a legal system justified by numbers that you cannot find a, either a U.S. citizen or legal resident can take that job in, in, in that area. Create a legal system. They can come with a, a temporary visa to come to work. And that, that That's going to do a couple things. Number one, it's going to, the magnets will go away. Number two, 
These people who come with a legal visa don't put themselves in harm's way. They don't have to hire a criminal organization. They're not going to drown in a river. They're not going to be lost in a desert. They're not. 31 percent of women won't be raped. Children won't die. Give it, give it a legal consequence, you know, a legal way to come in. But the legal system has to be based on fact, not just conjecture. Let, let's, let's raise this visa by 20,000 because Microsoft told us they need them. We need to verify that information. Have you... Uh made your uh, pitch for E-Verify to the president because it's three and a half years in now and we haven't really seen a lot of activity on E-Verify. Obviously, Congress would have to probably mandate it for everybody everywhere, but I think there is a lot the administration could do, and um, I'm not sure they've been as uh, vigorous in pushing it as they could have been. Well, um, I, have, I have made my push, but I know that uh, the, the members of Congress and White House are under a lot of pressure from the Chamber of Commerce and other people that think we need this workforce. That's why I think a, a study is showing, do we really need it? And justify it. Just because Microsoft or, or someone says they need 20,000 techies from uh, foreign techies, do they really need it? Or is there, is, there, is there U.S. citizens or even legal residents in this nation that can take those jobs? I know that I've talked to people myself that have lost their jobs. They've actually trained foreign nationals to do their job as part of this, bring them in, we need more workforce. And after they train them, they're gone because their, their salary is higher than the foreign nationals. So it certainly needs to be fixed. And I have, I have talked to the White House about it, absolutely. Um, to go back to the border, uh, you write a good deal about what your experience was with the, uh, you know, the families coming across the border when that was a, a real spike before uh, the new rules clamped down on it. And right now, nobody's getting across the border at all. They're turning people back without even uh, doing credible fear interviews. But so what and obviously that's where the whole zero tolerance, kids in cages, supposedly all that family separation stuff happened. Um, what, you know, sort of briefly, what do you think? Did anything go wrong there? Was it working? Is there a way to make that work in a way that's less uh, incendiary to people? What are your thoughts on that whole issue? Well, look, when it came to zero tolerance, it worked. In the three weeks that did zero tolerance, of course, the left wants to call it family separation, tearing babies from the arms of mothers. You know, first of all, no one tore a baby out of the mother's arms. And the, the same people that talk about tearing the, the baby out of the mother's <laughs> arms are the same people that have no problem with tearing the baby out of the mother's womb and killing it. They're fine with that, right? But it's but zero tolerance works. Law enforcement uses zero tolerance across this country all the time, whether it's drug enforcement or, or, or prostitution. You know, law enforcement uses zero tolerance. And why did why did why did we go get to zero tolerance? And why did the president declare national emergency? People people need to understand why this even happened to begin with. When the family crisis was happening on the border, fifty to sixty percent of the border patrol is no longer on the line. Border patrol made numerous pleas. Half our border patrol agents are no longer patrolling the border because they're changing diapers, making baby formula, making hospital runs. So half the border patrol was not on the border. What does that mean? That means at the same time half the border patrol was not on the border, opioids are being smuggled in this country to kill over 60,000 Americans, op opioid deaths. When, when the border is half patrolled and 50% down from border patrol patrols, if you're a bad guy, if you're a gang member, you're a drug smuggler, you want to smuggle opioids, if you're a terrorist that wants to come to the country to do us harm, you can't get a plane ticket anymore, it's too hard with all database checks, it's hard to get a visa with this visa security program come in, in, and do harm to this country because all the all the database checks are doing look for derogatory information. You're going to come to the country the same way 20 million others did to the southwest border, especially when half the border patrol is not on the line anymore because of the crisis. So the president and, and I think the Attorney General and Jeff Sessions recognized 31 percent of women are being raped making that journey. Children are dying. Cartels are making million dollars a year smuggling families and smuggling drugs because the border patrol the border is half control. 60,000 people or more died of overdose deaths. The president knew that the, the border was that vulnerable to terrorism because half the border was no longer there. When you take all this stuff and Congress was doing nothing, we asked them two years to close the loopholes calling this, they refused to take any action. The president said, all right, well, I, I'm going to take a current national emergency because i got to protect the country. i got to save lives, not only just U.S. citizens, save lives of the immigrants who are dying. So I think it was a good call to declare a national emergency. Zero tolerance was made under the same circumstances, saying, okay, what can we do? I think the administration looking to do anything it could legally to, to gain control of the border and save lives. And that's where I was at my last hearing. I got an argument with uh, uh, AOC when she talked about zero tolerance. And I did what I did. I did what I did as the ICE director to save lives. 
and, and protect this country. And think for a moment, when zero tolerance happened, what people don't want to talk about, 26% decline in the Rio Grande Valley within two weeks. If they were stuck with zero tolerance for another 30 days, we might not have that second surge. So I ask you this. The president now has got the border numbers down 80% from the high in May. If 80% of less people are crossing this country illegally, how many women weren't raped? How many children didn't die? How many millions of, of dollars do the cartels not make? Same cartels are murdered border patrol agents, by the way, and smuggle drugs in this country. How many drugs weren't smuggled because border patrol back on the line doing their job? How many lives were saved from overdose deaths? If you take that into consideration, you got to give this president credit. 80% decline means that 80% 80, 80, 80 decline in deaths, rapes, drugs. It, it just it just makes sense. So zero tolerance, despite how unpopular it was, and look, it's it's sad when you have to separate a parent from a child when a parent gets prosecuted, but it happens to U.S. families every day across this country when a parent gets prosecuted. It could have been messaged better. It could have been, you know, explained better because the left got a hold of the media right away and they had their whole false narrative run, running run, running on it. So it was hard to fight it after the fact. It could have been messaged better. It could have been operationally planned better with health and human services and, and their database failures. But the, the intent was not hate for migrants. The, the, the intent was to be, you know, you know, z xenophobic and, and, and racist. The intent was to secure the border, protect Americans, and save lives, not only Americans, but the immigrants. And so the intent was the intent was fine. I thought the intent was uh, was important. Um, before we go on, let me do a little commercial for uh, CIS. Uh, we are online at cis.org. If you've come in late to this discussion, the whole thing will be online at our website, as uh, is our earlier discussion from the other day with former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who's running to return to the Senate. Uh, and there is a uh, button on our website in case you have a few bucks uh, rattling around in your pocket to help uh, CIS, we're a nonprofit, and obviously this is a tough time for all businesses, including nonprofits. And again, to plug Tom's book, Defend the Border and Save Lives on Amazon uh, and anywhere else that sells books. Um, if I could ask a question about, you were talking about the harm that smuggled immigrants themselves undergo. And what really I think was a striking part of your book was toward the beginning where you talked about um, one of your most searing experiences with smuggling. This was this uh, famous Victoria, Texas example where there was a truck uh, where people had uh, been locked in and a lot of them had been killed and you were there on site. If you could just maybe sort of touch on why that was so important to you and why that matters in thinking about policy. Well, it was important to try to frame the argument. You know, I get a lot of people always ask me, why do you, we see you on Fox News a lot and you, and you look really emotional every time you talk about this. And people see me at Congress, of course, it's YouTube fame now, like, like comp, my testimony in front of Congress where I, I, I get very emotional, I lose my temper. And people need to understand, why is Tom Holman so emotional about this? Why does he take this issue so seriously? Because of what I've seen in 34 years of my career enforcing immigration law. And I've said it many times. If, if, if people saw what I saw, experienced what I experienced, investigated things I investigated that would turn your stomach, they'd understand why I take a hard line on this. And, and I get frustrated when members of Congress refuse to address it. For three decades, they refused to address it. And that one hearing with the congressman, I didn't care about dying children or if I ever held a dying child in my hands. He should have did his research because I have. And in that one incident made Tom Holman who he is today. So I talk about things. In that one incident, I, I talk about I was in Dallas giving a speech to international chiefs of police. I get a, a phone call from headquarters. They helped me take an Air Marine flight down to Victoria, Texas at a scene of a horrific smuggling uh, incident. Now, remember, if you read the book, I grew up in a town of 2,500 people. Right. At the time, the only dead person I ever saw was my grandmother in a casket at her funeral. Now, here's this, you know, this, this, this same person that grew up in West Carson, New York, standing on back of a tractor trailer. The scene was still the U.S. I mean, the, uh, the Texas Rangers walking through the scene because we we're taking over the investigation. And I'm in back of that tractor trailer and at my feet are 17 dead migrants. Uh, and two, there was two more that died. There was a total of 19, but two died on the way to the hospital. But I'm standing back with tractor with 17 dead migrants on my feet, including a five-year-old little boy that was the first one to perish. And he was 
and he was under his father's arms. His father tried to, you know, protect him, and his father died on top of him. And uh, it's it's a, it's a once you're there and you see it, and you smell it, and you and you feel the 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 the, the pain they must have went through. And when I thought, when I stand in the back of the track, Trevor, first thing I thought of, what was that small child, that five-year-old, what was his 30 minutes of life like? That last 30 minutes, what did he go through? And what did that father go through knowing he put his son in this position and watching his, his son die in his arm? The, the, the corner says probably 178 degrees in the back of that tractor trailer. They're in a steel box. It's black. They can't see. They had so many people in the back of that tractor trailer, standing room moments when people die. They're dying standing. It was just, it's what a nightmare way to, to, to perish. So after seeing that, and I had a five-year-old son at the time, and I talk about, I didn't sleep for several nights, but every time I close my eyes, I, I see my own son. So you, you think about, that wasn't alien smuggling, that was mass murder by smuggling organizations that didn't care about these people. And I talk about, my, over and over in my book, smugglers, th- 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 these people they smuggle, it's a, it's, it's, it's a commodity for them. They're worth so much money if they get them to the final destination. And if they die on the way, they leave them because they're worth, they're worth nothing anymore as far as the smugglers concerned. So I get angry when members of Congress refuse to close the loopholes that causes illegal immigration, such as the verify, such as, you know, changing the asylum system, such as letting us detain families long enough to see a judge. When they close those loopholes, make common sense changes, we can fix this border. We can't. It's never going to be foolproof 100%, but the president's already dropped illegal immigration on 80%. The president showed us it can be done. So and that's why I put tragedies that I've witnessed in my book so people understand where I'm coming from. And it, hopefully when they read it and they see it, they say, okay, now I know illegal immigration is not a victimless crime. Women are being raped. Children are dying. People are dying thousands every year. So yeah, maybe I should take an interest in this. And maybe when I see that illegal alien working in this restaurant, I'm not thinking, hey, just get here working illegally to take better care of his family. No, there's a whole underbelly of this that you've never seen. You don't understand. I want them to understand that underbelly. So they'll pick the phone up when they get done reading this book and call their senator or congressman and say, you need to fix this because I'm now I know what goes on. Now I know how it works. And now I know the truth. And that's what you remarked. The whole reason I wrote this book is out of frustration. You can't explain this issue in a six, seven minute Fox hit, right? You can't explain it uh, in testimony because they won't let you talk because they don't want to hear the truth. So out of frustration, says, you know what? They can't gavel me shut. They can't shut me up by gaveling a book. They can't shut me up by a limited number of uh, uh, interview time. So I wrote a book. They can't stop that. And so this book's about the facts, and it puts a false narrative to bed. You've got a couple of questions from uh, listeners. Uh, two of them uh, relate to the border. I figured I'd give them both, and you decide what you want to answer. One said uh, it seems to be a local um, local police officer who's dealt with a lot of illegal immigrants, dealt with ICE, And what he said is that he's found a lot of these people have been arrested over and over and over again by Border Patrol or by ICE, but they're not, or in Border Patrol in particular, they're not arrested. I mean, they're not prosecuted for multiple reentry because if you keep coming over, over and over again, you can be prosecuted. Crossing the border even the first time is a crime. And so would actually prosecuting people who kept coming, keep coming over and over rather than just dumping them back across the border. Would that be a deterrent? That's the first thing. And the other one is, do you think the numbers will go back up once this pandemic uh, scare uh, subsides? Well, your first question, I say, yes, the prosecution is a deterrent. It, look, we showed, we showed it during zero tolerance. Like I said, as unfortunate as it was that the administration was forced in a position to do zero tolerance because Congress wouldn't do anything to fix this, 26% drop within two weeks. So consequence is proven to work. And Border Patrol's operation streamlined. They've done many years, and I don't know where they're at with it now, but prosecution matters. But at the same time, you can't prosecute a million people because U.S. attorneys cannot handle it. They don't have the jail space. So that's why Border Patrol, when they prosecute some, they usually have multiple entries. So again, prosecution works. It's a deterrent. It, it, it's a consequence. And the, the, the Border Patrol has a consequence delivery system that shows every time you apply a consequence, it has an effect on repeat illegal entries. So yes, prosecution does access and deterrent. The second of all, do I think the border is, I, I think that right, right now the risk is this. We don't know what's going on in Mexico, the pandemic. We, you know, it, I'm sure the pandemic is just hitting them hard in their economy. 
Uh, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better in Mexico. So I think that there are going to be a certain number of people who come to the United States to try to get the best medical care in, available in the world. I, so that that worries me. The second thing uh, is, like I just said, with the unemployment rate so high right now in the United States because of the pandemic, the, 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 the remittances that go to Mexico, the, the billions of dollars every year go to Mexico, have been strangled because of a lot of illegal aliens in this country and also unemployed because of the pandemic. So it's, they're going to get a, a double whammy. They're, they're going to see their uh, GDP go down because of lack of remittances. They, they're going to see uh, the, their economy get hurt the same way as ours, ours does. And and let's face it, if you if they want to be treated in Mexican hospital, American hospital, some will try to come and get treatment. And what scares me is a place, place like El Paso, right? You got a population of about half a million on El Paso, 600,000 approximately in El Paso. But just south of Juarez, you have just under 2 million. So just a small fraction that comes across the border, they want to inundate uh, the El Paso Hospital, which is already up to their eyeballs and stuff. But here's my biggest concern. I said it for months. The president had a great idea by saying, we're going to attack the criminal cartels in Mexico to drive the violence down. And I said that on Laura Ingram's show one time. It says, my concern is if we don't address the cartels and the violence in Mexico, some liberal judge someplace is going to say Mexico is too violent, it's no longer a safe third country, you must stop the Remain in Mexico program, which has been a game changer. And it happened. So a judge in the Ninth Circuit decided it's, he's going to shut it down. Luckily, the Supreme Court stepped in during this pandemic and says, no, we got it, we got it, we're, we're going to let it remain, because I think out of, out of the risk of the pandemic. After this is over with, are they going to stick by it? The Remain Mexico program, I think, is going to be in trouble. And look, I've said it many times again. I appreciate the president getting Mexico to help us control their border by having a lot of military on the border, letting us do the Remain in Mexico program. Mexico has helped greatly. But if Mexico decides, decides to stop helping us, if they come and say, okay, we've had enough of this, it's too expensive, we're not doing it no more, we're in trouble because Congress still has not addressed the loopholes that would address this crisis. And there's only three loopholes. They could, they could fix them in a, a matter of a day. They haven't done it, and they haven't done it for one reason. They want to make immigration an issue for 2020. They want to, they want to try to show this president had failed a number one campaign promise. He's been unsuccessful. This is about the campaign. Now, let me tell you something. 80% decline because of this president, no help from Congress, no help from courts. He's been very successful doing it all by himself, so I think they're going to lose that argument. But that's, that's her plan. Their plan is to try to see this president fail. It's a sad day in America when the country of Mexico does more to help us secure our southern border than the, the Democratic leadership in Congress. The, uh, you brought up the uh, election, and while CIS is a nonprofit, we don't have any role in elections. Um, I was just wondering, you're as a private citizen, you can say anything you want, and what are your thoughts about how immigration and border policies would change if Joe Biden, assuming he actually ends up being the nominee, uh, wins the election and then takes office in January. What do you what do you think it'll look like when we get to in next year if that happens? We lose the border. We we'll lose the border. I mean, I, I'm in the middle of writing an op ed right now, Mark, on this. I looked at you go to Joe Biden's website, just his first page, his first paragraph, what he talks about, and and I've I've attacked every one of them. Joe Biden's already been on record saying that we won't deport illegal aliens unless they're convicted of a serious felony. What kind of message does that send to the rest of the world? He just basically said it's okay to enter this country legally in violation of federal law. It's okay to work here illegally. It's okay to be here illegally. It's okay to ignore a judge's order. Just don't commit a felony in addition to the crime you had when you entered illegally, and we're not going to remove you. That message from, from somebody who may be present in this country, do, do you common sense, do you think that's going to drive more illegal immigration when the president himself has said, Unless you commit a felony, we're not going to deport you. He also said the first action he's going to take as president is, is stop all deportations. He made a comment. He didn't think DUI was serious enough of a crime to deport somebody for. First of all, the law is clear. You can deport somebody for simply being here illegally. There's no prerequisite. you got to commit yet another crime and on top of the illegal entry crime. But he's already said DUI is not important enough to deport somebody on. DUI killed over 10,000 people last year. How can, how can the commander-in-chief, the president of the nation, say DUIs don't matter? And, and say it's, you know, only illegal aliens that we're going to deport are ones who commit felonies, significant felonies, not all felonies. That basically opens the door. Come. We're not going to remove you. So I think we're going to lose the border. I think, I, I think Sanctuary City is going to be going to 
across the city, even though they won't need them because I won't be able to deport them. That's got an aggravated felony. Now, I'm hoping Joe Biden, he's just saying this is, is part of his campaign, but all the success Donald Trump has made, President Trump has made, 80% decline on the southern border goes away day one if he doesn't retain the presidency. The uh, and last question, sort of along these same lines, um, are we going to see a uh, what? Go ahead. Let me add one more thing to that. Sure. How can I say something like that? When the, when the Ninth Circuit said we're going to stop the Remain in Mexico program until the stay was ordered by the Supreme Court, the day they said we're going to stop the Remain in Mexico program, hundreds, hundreds of illegal aliens in Mexico were lining up to come across the border because they knew they won't, they couldn't be held in Mexico anymore. Luckily, the Supreme Court took action quickly. It was, a, it was within hours of that decision that we're looking at another surge. It's proven itself. So again, I am a private citizen. I think I've worked for six presidents. I think Donald Trump has done more to secure our border than any six of them. And I respect every president I've ever worked for because they're the president. But I think Donald Trump has done more to secure the border and keep his promise. He not only talked the talk during the campaign, he's walking the walk. So I think if we want to secure a border and protect Americans from illegal immigration and, and save lives, Donald Trump's the guy. So uh, let's look at a different scenario in November. If Biden or whoever the Democrat is loses, the, if the president's reelected, are we going to see uh, Secretary Homan of Homeland Security? Or uh, is there any kind of uh, job we should be looking forward to, uh, for you in January? I'll say this, uh, never say never. I came back once from retirement for this president and depending on what the needs were, I, I'd probably come back again just because if you read this book, it's really my heart and soul. My whole life's been wrapped around this issue and I think we got the right guy in the office that can make effective change. So if he needs my help, I certainly consider coming back, yes. Well, Tom, thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to us. I uh, hope the uh, book sells well. Again, it's Defend the Borders and Save Lives um, uh, at Amazon and anywhere else you can buy books. It's also available on Kindle. I actually read it on Kindle. I have the hard copy here, too. Um, and um, the Center for Immigration Studies is online at cis.org. This whole discussion will be there. Like I said earlier this week, we had a talk with uh, Jeff Sessions. That's online as well. And for those of you who want to support the center, uh, as a nonprofit, your donations are tax deductible, large or small. We appreciate them. Uh, Tom, again, thank you. Uh, good luck. Um, hopefully, uh, I'll be calling you maybe Mr. Secretary or something else uh, soon, but we'll see how that turns out. In the meantime, um, we hope uh, all of our listeners will join us for our next immigration newsmaker talk whenever that is. We don't have one scheduled yet, but... We'll have one soon. Thank you, uh, Tom, and thanks to everybody who's watching. Bye. And let, me, and let me add one thing, Mark. Sure. If folks are watching, please support CIS. Uh, when I was a director of ICE, even when I was running ERO, Enforcement Move Operation Number Three in ICE, CIS was a great help to the the rule of law and helping ICE do their job. And they're on the right side of the argument, folks. We're in a fight for our we're in a fight for our lives right now. We're in a fight for this country. CIS gets it. They're on the right side of the issues, and, and they're, they're, they're helping shape uh, immigration in the future, so please support them. Very kind. Thank you, Tom. And uh, thanks to everybody listening, and we'll see you next time.